how would you determine the author of any book? In a library, you'd often find the author's name right on the front side cover underneath the title. But with the Bible, there's nothing. It's blank. Then, who is the author of the Bible? All the various answers to this question can be boiled down to two schools of thought. One, the Bible is the inspired word of the divine creator. Yes, the undeniable author is Jehovah God. Views in the second camp are a little less clear. Consider these thoughts. In 2008, in a survey of 1,000 people who attended some form of religious observance during their younger years, 44% stated they do not believe the statements in the Bible were true and accurate. When asked why, the most common response was, well, the Bible was written by men. Burton Mack, retired professor of New Testament studies, stated that right now, the Gospels must be viewed as the result of early Christian myth-making. The Gospels are the recorded accounts of Jesus Christ's life and teachings. So, the Bible is a collection of myths and fairy tales written by men. These sentiments are prevalent today, but do those opinions have merit? Or is true God the source of the Bible? That is the theme of our discussion this afternoon. To form a basis of confidence, a concrete conviction that the 66 books making up the canon of the Holy Scriptures are authored by the divine being. Of God. To do so, let's start very basic first. Does the content inside the Bible point to an author? Then we'll look at three lines of evidence to provide certainty in the Bible's divine authorship. The final case or conclusion should be clear. So, to begin with, does the Bible itself point to an author of the Bible? If it was a movie, does it have credit? Please open your Bibles with me to 2 Peter, chapter 1, verse 20 and 21. First off, keep in mind that one scripture also states that all scripture is inspired of God. But this scripture goes into exactly how we should understand that expression, inspired. That's 2 Peter, chapter 1, verse 20 and 21. For you know this, first, that no prophecy of Scripture springs from any private interpretation. For a prophecy was at no time brought by man's will, but men spoke from God as they were moved by Holy Spirit. Notice the footnote for moved is borne along or carried along, and the expression inspired of God translates as breathed by God. Job spread his Holy Spirit operated on the hearts and minds of each and every one of the Bible writers, inspiring them, moving them, carrying them along toward a goal, purposed by God. To illustrate this, think of how a businessman writes a letter. Sometimes the exact wording is very important, so he will dictate to his secretary, she will type it out, and of course the businessman will sign his name. But at other times, he will only give the key ideas to his secretary, and she will fill it in with her own words. Once again, the businessman will sign his name. Now, who is the author of the letter in the first case? In the second? Clearly, in both cases, it's the businessman himself. Yes, 40 different men penned the Holy Scriptures, but they were inspired, directed, authored by Jehovah God. Now keep in mind I mentioned three points of evidence. The first, the accuracy of Bible prophecy. Prophecy is predicting the future with definitive statements. Now if you polled many people in the audience about their favorite accurate Bible prophecies, the choices could be pretty lengthy. One may point to a military leader being specifically named 170 years before his birth. Or one may point to de detailed prophecies in the Bible book of Daniel. But in 
said, let's jump to the central figure of the scriptures, Jesus Christ. The words I quoted before it, it's 2 Timothy 3.16, do not say some scripture, but all scripture is inspired of God. The Hebrew scriptures, often referred to as the Old Testament, contain so many prophecies about the Messiah, making it difficult to count. The Messiah is Jehovah's specially chosen or anointed one. These prophecies pinpoint the Messiah's time of appearance, his background, his, the actions shown by and toward him, and his place in Jehovah's arrangement. They combine to form one grand picture that helps us identify Jesus as the Messiah. Psalms chapter 22 is a great example of prophecy touching on the Messiah. But first, please turn with me to Matthew chapter 27 to get a little context on the situation. And we'll get an idea of Jesus Christ's last fleshly hours on earth. That's Matthew chapter 27. In the verse we start reading, Roman soldiers will be leaving Jesus to his death. Verse 35. Verse 35. When they nailed him to the stake, they distributed his outer garments by casting lots. Now, also think of the attitude that was shown toward Jesus. We see that in verse 39 and 40. And those passing by spoke abusively of him, shaking their heads and saying, You would throw down the temple and build it in three days? Save yourself. If you are a son of God, come down off the torture stake. And we, as we continue to read, the chief priests, the scribes, even those that were nailed to a stake like Jesus, just kept piling on. Verse 46 reads, About the ninth hour, Jesus called out with a loud voice, saying, A lie, a lie, Mama, some fuck deny, that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now look at Psalms chapter 22. Please open your Bibles there. And we'll consider this prophecy written a thousand years before Christ even came to the earth. Psalms chapter 22. Start off at verse 7. All those seeing me mock me. They sneer and shake their heads in derision. He entrusts himself to Jehovah. Who has him rescue him? Let him save him, for he is so dear to him. Now, that attitude sounds familiar. Then look at verse 16. And keep in mind, Jesus was nailed to a stake. Romans commonly nailed convicted criminals or slaves. Nails were driven through their hands and their feet. Notice verse 16. For dogs around me, they close the enemy like a pack of evil doors. Like a lion, they are my hands and feet. Notice verse 18. And remember what the Roman soldiers did with Jesus' clothes. They divide my garments among themselves, and they cast lots for my clothing. Finally, look at verse 1 of 22, the first statement. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Word for word. <laughs> now, one may make the argument, Jesus was just intentionally fulfilling his prophecy regarding the Messiah. So that thought includes the acts of random people, Roman soldiers who would have no familiarity with Hebrew writings, and sworn enemies of Jesus' messianic claims. On top of all that, we have the words of a man. Yes, a perfect man, but still a dying man. Now, this is only one prophecy regarding the Messiah. As I mentioned, the Bible contains too many to even definitively count. For more information in that regard, I point you to page 200 of the publication, What Does the Bible Really Teach? Or you can just examine question 6 in the Revised New World Translation. Also, I have an invitation for all those in the audience, but 
please hold off. I'll be saving that for the end. One Bible scholar made an interesting statement when he compared, or rather, when he stated it, that the odds of one man fulfilling just eight of the prophecies with regard to the Messiah is one in 100 million billion. What is that number in some perspective? He stated that if you took 100 million billion silver dollars and spread them around, they would cover the state of Texas to about the depth of two feet. <laughs> now, if you had the person, just a random person, wander about with the with the blindfold and choose just one coin, the odds that you choose that one 